Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we explore the experiences of um, individuals from the Black, Asian and the minority ethnic communities. And this week, I'm really pleased to say that we've got Judith Cherney with us. And she's a senior lecturer, she's a senior lecturer at, um, in the Department of Engineering, well, Environmental Sciences at Imperial College. I'm gonna um, just start off by asking Judith um, a little bit to tell us a little bit about herself, a little bit about her early childhood and what it's like being and help to motivate her to, to the position that she's in at the moment. So Judith, once again, welcome. And if you don't mind kicking off with a little bit of your childhood history and, and, and um, such the like. All right, okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have been invited, a huge privilege for me. Um, my, my, my early, yes, what, well, I am at the Center for Environmental Policy Mm -hmm. And I teach in the course of environmental technology and also in the sustainable energy futures at right. Imperial. Yeah. What motivated me, I think, goes a long way back, if I have to think about that. And it's um, because what I do is a mixture sort of um, policy, economics, technology and technology and environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is what is called multidisciplinary work. Yeah. And I think that I have to split it between the political economy that I do and mm -hmm. the technical and the more scientific aspect. Okay. So if I go back, mm -hmm. I can say that Yes, my, my interest in political economy and in poverty reduction, it comes from my, my upbringing in Argentina. Because I come from Argentina, I was born in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And um, I was born, my parents were uh, born in Argentina. Then in, in where I was brought up, there was always a lot of debating, intellectual motivation. Remember that in Argentina, there is always something coming up there. Yeah. If it's not political, it's sports, arts, whatever. So I always remember in my home to be very much motivated to do debate, debate on intellectual aspects. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was an important aspect, an inspiration uh, for doing what I'm doing. I'm also um, was brought up in the city of Cordoba. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cordoba is the second most important city in Argentina after yeah. Buenos Aires, yeah. where Maradona, and Pope Francis were born. Right, yep. But not in the, in the same neighborhood, of course. Um, and my city was um, the place of the first university in Argentina. Mm -hmm. More than 400 years ago was yeah. built. So it, Cordoba is a place where there's a lot of interest for, for studying. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I never, ask myself whether I'm going to continue doing um, a, a higher education degree, but studying was always there. Right, okay. And your parents encouraged you, even the, the, from what I remember, your parents didn't go to university, but they were always encouraging you to, yeah? yeah? Yes, my parents were born, as I said, in Argentina, but my grandparents and great-grandparents were immigrants right in Argentina so they and they came from different places in Eastern Europe right to Argentina so my parents didn't have any professional or academic degrees 
but they were very interested in everything that was art and um and intellect yeah so i remember my father always um having uh, debates with me uh, about anything from be believing in god or not or politics in argentina yeah because i was young and idealist he would say to me all right if that is what you believe then stand up for what you believe in and fight for that brilliant so 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 that that spirit of you know what you believe in that stand for it don't just don't don't just be bought by the wayside because yeah you stand up for what you believe in that was yeah. that was injected into you from a very early age i think it was injected in my in my house in the society i lived mm -hmm. um we were brought up to believe that a better world was possible yeah and we could get it yeah uh, so those values of justice equality say yeah really accompanied me yeah I, everywhere i went after i left argentina until this day oh. so that is the that aspect that I, i'm working on that on on mm. that today but the other side which is the environment and the technology also came from our love for nature right. and that was also nurtured in argentina yeah from where i came yeah and by other by other um i would say gurus of environmentalism whom i was very lucky yeah to to come across during my career yeah yeah so argentina i I've, I've never been to argentina but oh have... you miss a lot <laughs> you don't know what you're missing <laughs> I, I, the closest i've come is is one watching the football right and um, but but the other thing was there was a show recently which was um some people had to travel across south america um and they went through argentina and i remember looking at the place across the whole of south america but i looked at the place i thought it's absolutely beautiful um the landscapes so i can understand having if you grow up in an area like that how the environment is very much important to you yeah and that's influence stand so that that message of standing up for what you believe in having the environment around you as well and having a passion to connect the two together it's kind yeah. of motivating is that kind of like where your motivations come from it, it comes mostly from that then i would say that in the in the 1980s i was fortunate i was doing my master in this country mm -hmm. and to be honest environment was not a priority at all at that time yet mm -hmm. but i heard about environment in academic framework right and i i really loved that and i became passionate and it was professor michael redcliffe mm -hmm. who introduced me to this uh, to this area yeah but at that time it was self indul indulgent Mm -hmm. to think about improving or or protecting the environment mm -hmm. but i i didn't think so mm -hmm. i thought that it was a priority for latin america mm -hmm. but for any other part of the yeah. world yeah so that was very important yeah. for me and then other other motivations i think is the sort of more scientific aspect because we do i do modeling today mm -hmm. i work with the energy renewable energy technology and it is a bad belief that if we uh, if we do science and if we do technology but we don't consider the social aspect and economic aspects there is always a gap that will affect the long term sustainability of any progress mm. and and that is one of the principles that i have really followed mm -hmm. in the last sort of 15 20 years of my career yeah yeah yes. so it's it's a combination of the science 
integrated with the technology, integrated with the social aspects for long-term sustainability. Um, yes. And how you can make that a reality, not just abstract ideas. That's right. Very good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, well, one, one of the things, so in that, so you, you just mentioned about the fact that you moved from um, Argentina to the UK um, when you met Professor Michael Radcliffe. Um, how was that transition for you, moving from one from the, the weather for one thing, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but what was that transition like for you? And what, did you envisage that you would kind of like make a home and make a life here in the UK? What, what happened? No, actually, I also lived in other countries right. before and after being in the in this country. Yeah, but I I didn't I didn't really envision that I will end up living in the UK. However, I I did study English, even if mm -hmm. you don't believe me. When I was in Argentina, yeah, I mean, the, Argentina is, is a very European um, sort of. Uh, country yeah so we did um we did know about european culture um i never envisioned argentina and the uk are very different however i i think i am today but i mean it's not just from today since a few years ago i talk of our countries my countries mm -hmm. Um, and it's coming to this country has been a, a, a fantastic journey for me. I mean, I liked London from the moment that I got in Heathrow. I remember for the first time. Yeah. I, I mean, I looked from the plane and everything was green. You, that's what yeah. it used to be. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I my experience is been very good mm -hmm. because I like this place. Mm -hmm. I like the culture, I like the people, I like many things. Mm -hmm. There are obviously challenges. Yeah. It is very different from Argentina. Yeah. In in many aspects. Um, however, I think that we as I say, we bring a very big um, sort of heritage of European culture and interest. And, and also I would say, I mean, our schooling in, in Argentina is considered very, very good. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it wasn't difficult to, to mm -hmm. become part yeah. of, for example, the educational um, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you I, I you made you had you had that phrase that you said that you look at it as our countries not um because i often hear from different people who say my country and they will refer to their home to their homeland as it were but you put it as my country right so a recognition of a sense of belonging to both how 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 did you come to that realization of that belonging to both as it were does that make sense yes good question i think i came to that realization since i was i was um voted to chair a a, a very well established society in this country which is the anglo argentine society right. between 2017 and no between 2014 and 2017 i was i mean i directed this society which is a big one i mean it's more than 1000 members <coughs> it was established in 1948 wow following the 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 war in order to bring the two cultures the two societies together because there were already commercial relations between the two countries. Yeah. And in, since then, I mean, it's been a very strong society related to the embassies. Yeah. And I 
I was paradoxically the first Argentine wow. to chair the society because it's mostly British society, yeah. but also with Argentine members. So yeah. I was the first Argentine and not surprising, I was the second or the second or third woman ever mm -hmm. to chair that society in 66 years yeah. since it was created. Yeah. So there I learned that there was a, a, a big, I mean, a large number of British English people who migrated to Argentina in the 19th century and they established the, them there. Yeah. But their, their, their children's or children's children eventually decided to come back to, our, to, to this country, to yeah. the UK, but they have very strong ties to Argentina. Yeah. But they are, I mean, they speak English mm -hmm. properly, <laughs> but they speak Spanish with a bit of English accent. Yeah. yeah. And it's the opposite of me. I came from Argentina to establish myself here. Yeah. So there I learned that it is our two countries. I mean, there are roots here and there. And it's a, it's a different identity. It's an identity. We can't, sometimes we don't need to have just one identity, maybe a complex identity. And this is one. And in many of my speeches that I had to give, I started to use our countries. Yeah. And that is how I feel. I mean, I never asked my sense of belonging yeah. uh, in Argentina. And I live here so many years and I also have children and they were brought up here. So yeah. children and grandchildren. So is I am not first generation, say. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so so you over time the roots which you, so, so it's um, very interesting that you were saying that roots were established because the roots which were established from the, the English going across the Argentina and then establishing roots there and then the reverse in yourself coming up and establishing roots that gives you that shared ownership of this is our country it's not your country it's not your country it's our country i, I really i really i do like that concept of um, it being our country so have you have you i remember earlier on you were talking about the fact that your grandparents were immigrants, as it were, to Argentina, right? And now you've come to the UK and you've settled in. Have there been any challenges for you? I, I, I know I'm going to say you're a, you're a white lady, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you speak, there's almost a, there's an immediate you're white, but you've got differences, as it were. Has that ever been a challenge for you, do you think? It would, I'm not sure if I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if that's ever been a challenge to you. Have you felt accepted um, as a result of going beyond just the superficial what you look like, if that makes sense? Yes, yes, it's, uh, it's a question that I ask myself more and more now because of these, uh, the Black Mothers, Life Matters, for example, yeah. which I'm totally part of it, yes? Yeah. I am not Black, mm -hmm. but I, I suffer some of the similar, yes, yeah. discrimination. So I think, as, as, as you say, I mean, I look like other people who are, black, mm -hmm. uh, who are white, but I talk slightly different. Mm -hmm. I have some appreciations that might be slightly different, some cultural background that is different. Um, I can do things that maybe they, they like, but they don't do, like as tangoing, going mm -hmm. to tango for me is natural. Um, so, in that sense, I feel that I have more of a background, let's say, it's a rich background. Yeah. 
However, it's not always in my benefit, right. not always. And yeah. this is where the challenges come. Yeah. And, I, and the places where I felt that is probably more in the academic, in the academic um, environment. And that is where the barriers start to, to be noticeable. Uh, something that I didn't really realize too much before. I'm, I'm not going to push you, but could you give us <laughs> an, an illustration of what you mean by that? Because when, when people talk of academia, it yeah. looks, it's almost like we talk about the enlightenment. The enlightenment came from learning and understanding and and so that's where we've made progress but you're saying that or if i'm hearing right that some of the barriers which you faced have been within the academic sphere as opposed to outside of the academic sphere is that right uh, yes it is right outside i mean outside i i mean it could be always the the the, the odd question where where are, where do you come from you have an accent well, I'm used to that already. That, that is what happens. Uh, but it's more, I could give you two examples. One example is when I started doing my PhD and I started to go to the room where my colleagues were. Most of them were British, but not all. It was quite an international um, uh, st student. But, that, and this is at the London School of Economics. I did my PhD at the London School of Economics. And I mean, I was doing similar type of work, but I was not invited to present my work when I already had experience in doing certain type of work. Right. But my colleagues were invited, my British colleague, and it was not only me who was excluded, only other students from Brazil or from Peru, they were excluded. And I didn't pay too much attention, but I realized that something was not totally right. I was passionate about my work, so that was my interest. Just write, go to conferences, that was my first shock, I would say. But then I think being at Imperial has also been a challenge from that point of view, being Latin American, being uh, not a recognized BAME um, uh, status, say, mm -hmm. um, also has its, its barriers. Mm. I mean, I can tell you much more about that. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I think, I think that um, I, I, I came to Imperial more than 20 years ago as an RA. I was selected um, to do a, a job just straight, straight after my PhD. Uh, and so I worked, it was lovely work, I really enjoyed. And it was at the Center for Environmental Policy, which was differently a different name then um, and then I continued and I continued and I think I I mean I did everything that is supposed to be done mm -hmm. I continued my research I did a lot of lecturing I supervised many many students PhD master students I think I mean I I am lucky to say that I'm nationally and internationally recognized. I've got many of my students, which is wonderful. They have continued the careers. They are senior lecturers, even professors today. Mm -hmm. um, however, I feel that Imperial is yet to acknowledge my achievements. Mm. through appropriate titles or mm -hmm. appropriate uh, career progression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I could say is that the challenge has been access 
from my point of view, mm -hmm. what is equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. The equal opportunities were equal, but not equal to everybody. Yeah. 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 That is That's how I could summarize it. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push you on it um, unless you want to say any more. But that's a very interesting that's a very interesting um, revelation that you've given that people who you've supervised, people who you have helped along their career pathways, have gone on and and been successful. But you seem to have not stagnated, but you're not getting the recognition for the things that you're doing. How does that kind of like make you feel in turn? How does that make you feel? Well, if, if that, does that give you that sense of belonging? <coughs> me? When, when it mm. seems that you're constantly being undermined or, or not recognized, how yeah. does that make you feel, do you think? Yeah, so, uh, sometimes it, 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 well, it makes me feel disappointed, sometimes frustrated because always the opportunities went to somebody else yeah. that's right uh, in the sense of sense of belonging it's, it's very interesting because i noticed that i do feel a sense of belonging to imperial mm -hmm. but that is when i am outside imperial when i go to conferences when i am leading a, an international project when i am fulfilling other roles in the community you see and so I am representing it and in, I mean I'm representing I think not that partly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then when I am at Imperial it is a sense of uh, not having the full acceptance from the college yeah. sort of sort of um, have um, outsider mm -hmm. So the sense of belonging is being reduced because the inclusion is not total. The acceptance mm. is not total. Mm. And which I think those are important components mm. to generate this feeling of belonging. Mm. That's, 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 that's really, really interesting. The idea of that acceptance. Uh, and the yeah. acceptance. So when you talk about acceptance, are you referring to it as acceptance of you as a, as, because let's look at it. You, you've got many intersectionalities here. You've got, you're a female, you're Argentinian. Um, yeah. And I remember when we were talking about this the other day, you said, and I'm small as well, right? I'm I am petite as well. <laughs> all, the, all the wrong attributes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> so from from those perspectives um what is it that you think when you talk about full acceptance mm -hmm. is it on a holistic scale what what's what what parts do you want to be accepted if that makes sense mm -hmm. The, the the female aspect is it's been very it's been crucial because if I see the the history let's say in the last 15 20 years women were not equally promoted as men mm -hmm. but then if you see that the, the the woman or the academic is not just a woman it's also someone who talks slightly differently, but also is coming from a developing country, which is in itself seen as less advanced, mm -hmm. then um, the difficulty is, is even worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many, I mean, yes, how many, um, I don't know, Asian or, or Black or Latin American women are professors in my mm -hmm. department? Yeah. How many? None. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to say that there are not Argentine women who are successful because there are, and there are, and there have been in Imperial as well. Mm -hmm. And I can just think of, of one, which is Dame uh, Julia Pollack, for example, mm -hmm. or, or other professors who are Argentine, Latin American. Mm -hmm. But it's not the 
majority. And being Latin America in, implies being sort of invisible, mm -hmm. as, as invisible as a definition in itself, because mm -hmm. as I said, there's no category, uh, but also the discrimination that goes is very sub subtle, because mm -hmm. as you say, I, mm -hmm. I look uh, not too different. Yeah, yeah. There's something you just pick, you just said, which I just want to pick up on, which was that that concept of being invisible, yeah. Mm. Um, and you said about even in the categorization. And are, are you referring to like job applications and stuff like that? Because oftentimes when you look down and you see um, black, white, Asian, da, 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 there's not a box to say if you are. Latin American or anything like that is is that what you were referring is, is, is that yes. kind of that, that sense that of is one of the invisibilities that is very right because when you have to cross one uh, I mean also now in the universities I mean do you want the statistics do you don't know whether Latin American or Latino are mm -hmm. because you are either other mm -hmm. other white or do not know. Yeah. So your status and 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 your conditions and what happened with you along many years, if you want to trace an academic history, will be lost. Yeah. You see, yeah. mine is not reflected in the statistics, for yeah. example. Yeah. Which is very, very that's that's such a brilliant point. Because when you think about it, when people say that we want to see what's happened, they always say, well, show us the facts, show us the statistics. Yes. And what you're basically saying is, I've been written out of the statistics just <laughs> because of the way in which you've categorized things. Is yes. That, yeah? Yes. And it's, it's, it's very obvious in, 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 our, in our environment, but it also happens outside. It happens yeah. in other sectors. Yeah. In, in the economy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Judith, I'm just wary that we've just gone past the half hour mark and I always like to open up some to see if anyone else has questions because I know that I can carry on asking questions for, <laughs> for the full amount of time. So I'm going to just say if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Judith, if you want to put your hand up or put something in the question box in the chat box, that would be great. But so I'm still trying to, how can we overcome this barrier of invisibility? Oh, William, I'll come to you in a second. Sorry, all right, I've just started. So, all right, I'll save my question. William, go ahead. And then I'll, I'll ask you my question afterwards. Uh, thank you, Judith. Yeah, really fascinating um, talk. Um, I was wondering, yeah, given this kind of sense of, um, I suppose frustration a bit in terms of like your achievements not being recognized. I wonder how, do you have any sense of um, just consolation or pride in the fact that the, the work you've done over the years that it's now like considered to be so important, you know, that probably when you started environmental, these kind of environmental things that you were doing weren't considered important, but now they're, they're global issues, aren't they, of major, importance all around the world so even if the institutions don't recognize it's like the work almost is is, is broadly recognized so how does that make you feel mm. yes a lovely question I, I i do i do have a lot of consolation as you said it's more than consolation to be honest i mean it gives me a lot a lot of pleasure i mean to know that some of my work has been inspirational for, for other people, for, for, other, for students and not only for students. And to know that I am, I mean, I am called from different places in the world to, to, to help or to be examiner or, and, and I think more important even is that we have had an impact, my work has had an impact in developing countries, even we, once we got a prize for impact in, um, this was in, in one of the countries I work for, for the work we do. 
and also my publications. I, all that is what is priority for me, for me and, it's, and it's precisely that, what I think nowadays that kept me going is my passion for my work, um, which I think is, is, is crucial. I, um, but then there is a moment that you realized that after all, you are no, no better than your colleagues, but you are no worse. Then you ask, well, why? Why and why do I need to replicate this model if I don't fight for what I believe in, then what happens to me will also happen to other people. Um, so uh, yes, I mean, my is is the frustration is there, but is 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 a sort of engine to do something positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to make a comment, but I've also seen somebody else who would like to also ask you a question. So I'll come to the question after. I'll make my comment afterwards, Simon. If you would like to um, ask your question, please. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Judith. Thank you very much for, um, it's really fascinating to hear you talk. Um, my question's kind of related actually to the, to the last one. Um, I, I work in the Grantham Institute and we, um, we, we talk um, a bit, quite a bit about how um, we kind of, we, when we're, when we're kind of talking to people about environmental issues, we often find that we're talking to people uh we're talking to people from a very like a british middle class white perspective like these are the people who it's commonly perceived that uh they like belong to an environmental community um and i think there's figures on it as well I, i'm not kind of too familiar with with that but i wondered you know and, and it's it's very patently obvious that people from all different uh, backgrounds and all different uh, parts of the world belong to their own environmental communities and I and and that the the priorities are sometimes different or your perspective is different and and I wondered how um, if you can say something about how you feel a sort of if you feel sort of part of a, a, a British in, uh, environmental community as well or like yeah I just think it's really fascinating your sort of dual your dual belonging that you were talking about earlier does it extend to that and how is it different mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know I do feel um I do very feel very close to the environmental uh, the British environmentalism because I was nurtured by, as I said, Professor Redcliffe, Professor Timo Riordan, and all the big names that this country really produce in environmentalism. I think that without them, it would be very, very different. Um, but I no, I think in this case, I will bring the, the issue of global environment. I do feel that the environment is, is not a national or a country issue. Mm. It's a global issue. And I discovered that when I did the PhD, actually, because I was studying the effect, the impact of air pollution on health in very developed countries. And, and I found out that people who were uh, most affected were not only poor people, it was everybody. Also poor, rich, whoever. And that was many years ago. Climate change is not, um, it's not a national problem, although emissions reductions is a national, it's a political a problem. Um, environment, I think that is more and more a concern that affects us all. From Argentina, the United Kingdom, France, Peru, the United States, 
I think is is independent of, of, of where you are. And I must say, I want to bring very quickly an, a something that happened many years ago when I started to be interested in, in the environment. I said, listen, they are really deforesting the south of Argentina, taking away all the forest. And somebody told me, so what? There are socioeconomic problems in Argentina nowadays. And the, econ the economy is more important. And I, and I said, well, we'll see. Let's see in 10, 20 years if we think still like that. I don't know if I answer your uh, initial question, uh, but um, yeah, that is how I feel about environment. May, may I ask a quick follow up? Wayne, is that okay? Go ahead. Yeah, please do. <clears throat> I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of also interesting. I, I uh, you know, you you kind of touched on there, like the legacy of of, of British uh, environmentalists. Um, I I don't necessarily know the two you just mentioned, but um, I sort of I, I studied biology myself. I studied genetics and like plant biology and and. I, I, we didn't learn about it at university, but sort of subsequently, I've learned for myself, there's sort of this, this kind of colonial legacy of, of genetics, of environmentalism. And a lot of it, a lot of it, although we're not taught it, is about sort of what, what British and European environmentalists and scientists uh, kind of did to other, other uh, other cultures other kind of parts of the world and and we sort of still it's it's very hard to escape from the way that we view environmental topics through the lens of how of how the the white europeans the the the, the ones the names that we know the names that that we say oh these were the great people from environmentalism um how does that how does that come across to you does it affect how you view them and and sort of your does it make you want to be be bigger than them i guess <laughs> <laughs> no i can't i appetite i told you <laughs> um, no but it's a, it's, a, it's a good i mean it's a good question and i think that brings the whole debate on the the countries which polluted and ruined ruined the yeah. environment for so long now come to developing countries and tell them what to do and tell them not to contaminate the environment mm. which is unfair of course because developing countries need to produce um, in order to um, to become uh, or, or to, to develop, let's mm. say. Mm. What I, I mean, I think that there are things that can be useful, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it comes from from European countries or from white um, white cultures like technology, for example. If the technology is useful for developing mm. uh, for developing countries, um, it can be um, adopted. But again, that is where my political economy comes in. You see, I, I do, in my work, I, I do have into consideration always what is the policy in, in those countries. And more than that, I do go to the areas in developing countries and we do find out what the population wants and needs mm. um, and that, that is something that is I mean it's, it's been a, a, a not easy but we have done systematic studies and we do have good results on how to find out more firsthand what population in in Africa in Latin America in Asia uh, it's not just Latin America mm. um, what is necessary is not always good to bring and to 
impose, as you say, what uh, the 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 ideals of the Western world. I do agree with that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for letting me have a follow up. I'll let you That's carry fine. on. That's thank fine. You. Thank you, Simon and William, for your questions. Both of them very insightful. And it kind of like um, gave me when I was thinking about what you've just the way that you've answered it. It's it's kind of like a holistic approach, because you mentioned earlier on about the fact that um, part of your role is about evaluating the social impact. So it's about the technology going in, but it has to be technology with a purpose for helping the individuals in that situation. And it kind of, kind of like the, the question I was gonna, um, I was gonna ask you, and I, I think this will be my final question, which is question in relation to how would you, how do you overcome the invisibility, right? Because based on what the questions which we've just asked, which were asked by Simon and was asked by William, sometimes, even when we're talking about the, the, it from an environmental perspective, the same people where it's impacting the most, their views are almost invisible to those people coming in saying, this is what you need to do, if that makes sense, yeah? Yes. So how can we um, overcome that invisibility? Does, it, does that make sense? Yes, I mean, that invisibility <coughs> can be addressed from, as you say, from a sort of um, work point of view. Mm -hmm or from the personal point of view, yeah. how I will do to yeah. overcome that. From the, from, the, uh, from the work point of view, this is something that I've always wanted to do and is to find out the priorities of, 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 pe of pe people's priority should be part of any decision making. That is, that is to, to break that invisibility or to give voice to people who are voiceless. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the reasons I work with, um, I've, I've been done a lot of work in Latin America and, and in, in villages and in places where indeed people don't have a voice, mm -hmm. not only invisible, mm -hmm. they, they can, they're not heard. Mm -hmm. So the way is by enabling, I, I would call methods methods to incorporate their views into any decision making into any um or any uh, resolution that could affect the direction of policy yeah? yeah so how you bring these views into the information that is going to be fed for policy decision makers. Yeah. Yeah. From the personal point of view, to break the invisibility, I mean, I couldn't reduce the passion for work. That is something that I would never say, give it up. Yeah. But I think that one has to talk earlier. One has to think um, that if, and I come back to equal opportunities, equal opportunities should not be just written on a form or on a paper. You have to make them a reality. And for that, never believe that, or don't let people make believe that you are not good enough to get to a position because that is in the end, what you end up feeling that uh, it's because of you. Yeah. When in reality, it's not necessarily that it's because of you. Yeah. So to be visible, become more visible, stand again, stand up and say, stand up for what you believe in. Even if <laughs> sometimes you find walls in front of you, just do it. 
Judith, I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you for that. That this has been a fantastic discussion, fantastic interview, and some fantastic insight. Um, one of the things which I would definitely take out of this is that we have to stand up for what we believe in, you know. And if we if if people do seem to be invisible, if people's voices aren't being heard, then we who do have the capacity and the ability to be able to help their voice be heard it's our responsibility to do that yeah um and i want to just wish you um every continuing success and I, I know we've worked together in the past and i know we're going to continue to work together in the future it's been absolutely brilliant um having you on today okay oh, thank you very much and thank you everybody who is listening to this right. all the best to all i'm gonna I'm going to just advertise what's coming in the new year. Can you believe it? Just uh, let me just share my screen. Um, in the new year, we're going to have Adapo um, Adeola, Adeola um, who's an award-winning illustrator and designer. And he recently <coughs> won a prize for his book, Look Up which I think um, is a children's storybook, but it's fascinating. So we're gonna have him on the 8th of January, 2021, believe it or not, um, we're there already. And if you've missed any, or you'd like to see um, Judith's um, interview again, then you can go to our YouTube page, which is um, tinyurl.com forward slash belonging <coughs> dash IAO. So, it's been really great um, interviewing all of these wonderful people over the 2020. And I just wanna wish everyone all the very best for the festive season. And I'll see you again in 2021. So take care. And anyone who wants to stay for the after party, I'm stopping the recording now.